The first scripture I'd like to share with you today comes to us from the book of Micah and chapter 5 and verses 2 through 5a. Let us hear the word of the Lord. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth, and this one will be our peace. The second scripture I'd like to share with you is from Luke's Gospel in chapter 1 in verses 39 through 55. Again, may we hear God's word together. Now at this time, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened? to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. And he has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. Every year we sing that first Noel, which means Christmas carol, and we say that it was sung by the angels to the shepherds out in the fields on the night that Jesus was born. But actually, that Christmas carol is not true. The first Christmas carol was not sung to the shepherds by angels. Do you know who actually sang the first Christmas carol? Actually, the first Christmas carol, indeed, the first Christian hymn, was sung nine months before then, and it was sung not by angels, but by a young maiden named Mary. This Christmas carol also has a name. It is called the Magnificat because of the many words that magnify God within it. And Mary's Christmas carol has held a very special place in the church for centuries. The first Christmas carol, the Magnificat. Today's message, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may you be glorified and magnified through Mary's words and her song that she sang to you for the great mercy and grace you extended to her and indeed to all mankind that we should have a Savior now who is Christ the Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. The unbelievable had happened. A girl named Mary in a little village of Nazareth 
had been chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. That was a dream and ambition, by the way, of just about every young maiden in Israel. And as a result of the angel Gabriel's announcement, this young girl believed God and was so thrilled at the news that she composed and sang not only that first Christmas carol, but really the first Christian hymn. So the Magnificat is this beautiful cultural lyrical poem by a Jewish peasant girl who must have known many of the sacred writings of the scriptures and she must have known them by heart. She used words and ideas from the song of Hannah, for instance, in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. You can see part of that in her song. There's also the glimpse of Leah's utterance in Genesis 30, verse 13. She must have also known Psalm 146, Psalm 98, and Psalm 118. She must have listened intently to the prophet Isaiah whenever that scroll was read. So this was an intelligent woman who knew the word of God in her heart. And so Mary was filled with rapturous joy and wonder. And no one has ever experienced that kind of joy or wonder in exactly the same way before or since. So out of every virgin Jewish girl, she alone had been given the honor and the privilege of bearing the Messiah. Now, how can we possibly then feel the excitement and wonder of this young girl's heart how can we ever enter into the praises and joy of her song? What in this world could possibly compare with the greatness of being chosen as the mother of the Messiah? To be declared Miss America or Miss Universe would pale in comparison. Perhaps there is nothing that is quite of the same importance and honor given to a human being than what was given to Mary. Yet you and I can still sing her Christmas carol, the Magnificat. For that first Christian carol was recorded in the scriptures, not just for us to read, but also for us to sing without the melody in our heart of hearts. Why? Because Mary's song has become ours when we sense how God has blessed our lives. Her song becomes ours when we sense how God has delivered his people. We can sing her song when we're able to see his working in our lives and how he works in our world. Her song sings within us when we realize that his message has been given to us. Her song becomes ours when we invite his living presence into our hearts and willingly agree to do what God has asked us to do. Her song becomes ours when we confess in our hearts by faith, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Mary was chosen. She was chosen by God. And the angel also announced, Behold, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. Now here were two impossible situations that were to happen with relatives in the same family at the same time. Mary, a virgin, and Elizabeth, two old bear children, were both to have a child. How many impossible situations, therefore, do you think that you have in your life or in your family that God couldn't possibly answer? How many lost causes do you have that you think God cannot possibly do anything about them. Can it be true what Jesus said about the Father? All things are possible with the Father. Now I'm sure that one of the reasons Mary could sing so fully from her heart was that she was so ecstatic to hear such unbelievable news. And Mary wasn't the only one, therefore, who had a miracle to sing about. Elizabeth did too. Brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the Christmas story and truth is that nothing shall be impossible with God. You can be assured of that. So therefore, Mary traveled with great haste, it says, to be with Elizabeth. 
And at this point, these two women were actually the only people on earth to know of the special circumstances surrounding the Savior's birth. Think about that. That alone is pretty convincing proof that the scriptures are the word of God, not just made up stories from a male-dominated culture. You see, for these two women, not men, were the only humans in the world at that time to know for certain that God was ready to fulfill the long-awaited promises given to their ancestors by the prophets. And as we saw earlier in another message, John the Baptist gave the message of Christ's coming, and that was not given uh, by God to the kings or the powerful or the uh, religious leaders or the most educated or the most rich people on earth, but as in this case, it wasn't even given to men. Like the resurrection of Christ, the women were told first. And not only that, but the coming of the Messiah was first given to a teenage poor peasant girl, even before those lowly shepherds heard the news. And so that sign of this message being given to a virgin conceiving predicted by Isaiah, as we read, was completely miraculous. And yet, as is the case with all of God's miracles, nobody is forced to believe them. It is not the most convincing entrance that God could have made into his world, is it? There were plenty of other natural explanations of which even Joseph imagined. He was very upset, in fact, about what he was thinking it could be. There were and are today alternative explanations that some churches put forward and scholars toy with that have nothing to do with the truth and only place doubt in people's minds and steal away the Magnificat that other people might have sung in their hearts if they had known the truth. And yet this is precisely the kind of modest, humble entrance that God makes. He chooses people whom we do not expect. He doesn't always choose the powerful to speak through them. He uses methods and situations of which we think impossible. God is active in our world. But we don't always see it because he doesn't do things the way we anticipate that he should. But why should we completely understand God's choices about these things? After all, he's God and his ways are above our ways. And yet even all the while God is doing these great and blessed things, we tend to attribute our blessings to our own efforts or some dumb luck. And even with all of his miracles, if we look hard enough, we'll always find some kind of more plausible explanation. His miracles usually can be explained away if we work hard enough at it. We tend to say almost anything but this, God did it. And yet Mary didn't do that at all. She didn't explain away God's miracles. She accepted the responsibility and she simply believed like a child. For she was a young maiden. Friends, it's only when we dare to believe that God is actively working in our lives that Mary's song can become ours. You can't sing the Magnificat in your heart without eyes of faith and without becoming like a child in your trust of God. So, number one. What is this treasure located in her song? Let's look at the first treasure. In the first part of this song, she sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. In God, my Savior. That line is from where the title of the song comes. The word magnifica comes from the Latin translation of the Greek. It literally means to enlarge or to magnify. Mary was singing about the greatness of the Lord in her life as her Savior. But notice that she rejoices in a God who is her Savior. Mary needed a Savior because she, like all of us, was born in sin. Only sinners need a Savior, therefore. 
Mary could not have been without sin. Her spirit rejoiced because God forgave her. And she magnified the Lord as her Savior. Why should you rejoice in her Savior if she needed no forgiveness? How could anyone suggest that Mary was sinless after hearing her song magnifying her Savior? But God also has done these great things for you and me. He has rescued us from the power of sin, even over death and the grave. So we too can rejoice in God our Savior. Why? Because we need a Savior. Things are not going well for us. And in the end, they certainly will not until we receive Christ. It is only because He saved us that we can magnify the Lord in our hearts. So to magnify means that we give God a greater place in our thoughts. To magnify means that we give Him a, be a better place in our everyday lives. To magnify means that we see Him more clearly and that we can honestly attribute our blessings to Him and not dumb luck. To magnify means that we also pledge abroad to others the reasons that we do praise Him. Therefore, I desire to magnify God in my life because I am convinced that He is my Savior and of the great things He's done for me. He has brought me to a place where He is using me for His glory. He has allowed me to, to help others and help lead others to a saving and growing knowledge of Jesus Christ. He helps me to preach every week and gives me the words that I need to say. He's given me opportunities that I never thought I would have. He brought me through seminary and four degrees and 24 years of schooling and 37 years of ministry and given me a loving and supportive wife and children and grandchildren. He has given me health and a wonderful church and home and enough resources to live. These things, among many others, compel me to magnify the person of Jesus Christ in my life and more than anything else, He has saved my soul. What has the Lord done in your life that compels you to want to magnify Him, to sing His praises? If we are Christian at all, we should each have similar stories to tell about what Jesus has done for us. How do we magnify the Lord? How much place in our lives do we grant Him? What more does God need to do for you or me to give Him a bigger place in our daily thoughts and actions? You see, Advent is a time when God should be magnified. This is the season to go tell it on the mountain. This is the season when the Lord increases and we must decrease. Magnify the Lord in your life and you'll be singing the first part of Mary's song. Now the second part of her song she sang, for he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Mary was unable to recognize any reason why she should be the object of divine compassion and consideration and choice by God. And that's precisely how I feel in my life and certainly how I feel about the ministry. There are many things in my life and certainly about my salvation as well I've never felt worthy of in any way. I'm not worthy to be a pastor to preach God's word. Maybe this is how you feel too. Maybe you don't feel worthy to serve Christ or to be a Sunday school teacher or an elder or a leader or a deacon or a member of his church. Why does God choose you and me? We should be humbled by God's choice of us. And furthermore, why would he send his son to die for me and my sins? Why did he die for me? I don't deserve that kind of love and sacrifice. I don't deserve his consideration at all. What do you believe God owes you? I hear people today thinking and talking like God owes us something. He owes me nothing. And yet he's given me all things through faith. And yet I owe him everything. Now, we can do nothing to deserve the grace and mercy of God. 
And we are nothing more than what Mary said she was. Humble servants who have chosen to say yes to his precious gift and follow him. But he bestows his grace upon all those who fear him or revere him and who submit to his will for their lives. So if you have experienced his undeserved grace and favor, which is what grace is, undeserved favor, then you know that God doesn't owe you a thing. And you can sing this second verse of Mary's song. The third part of the Magnificat, she sang, he has scattered those who were proud in their own thoughts. And he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. God, generally speaking, rejects the proud. If they're proud of what he's doing in your life, that's one thing. But if you're proud of yourself and other accomplishments and things that have happened, then God rejects that. He did so in Mary's day and he still does today. Woe to people who are proud in themselves and self-righteous and arrogant and benevolent in their power, for they will be brought down. When you're malevolent in your power, you will be brought down. Mary also extolled the justice of God. God will bring to justice all those who oppress other people and exploit their neighbors. This is one of the basic messages of Christmas. For all those who are meek shall inherit the earth. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Mary certainly had a spiritual hunger. And God gave her the desires of her heart. And any of us who truly hunger for righteousness and the things of Christ, we shall be filled. If we hunger but are not satiated in Christ, then we need to ask the Lord, what is the basis of our hunger? Is it something that God will provide for us, or is it something of our own making? Mary had a spiritual hunger, and God will also provide physical sustenance, as he said in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. So does Christmas cause you to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you long more for the spiritual gifts from God than the gifts that have been wrapped and lay underneath the Christmas tree? Because the gifts that God will give you will satisfy you forever. And the gifts under the tree will only last a few hours at best. If we long for truth and righteousness, the third verse of Mary's song is deep within our hearts. And fourthly, lastly, Mary sang, He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers. She believed in not just her own promises for herself and her life, but a larger promise that God gave to all of her people. It has been the pattern for all of Israel, and so it was, and so it is, and so it shall be. The Christ born to save you and me is going to save Israel, and is now also the Christ born to save Gentiles. And as God remembered Bethlehem Ephrathah, such a little town of people on the west bank of the Jordan, just south of Jerusalem, so God shall remember you and me and the nation of Israel and all those who follow him. God never forgets his promises, not even to just one of his little children. He remembers them all. Christmas should remind us that God has not forsaken us. God will never leave us nor forsake us. God also blesses the nation that listens to his voice, and he will not forget their faith and deeds. God also blesses the churches that have listened to his voice and believe his promises. He will not forget their faith and deeds. For if we believe that God so loved the world and wants to bless his chosen people, we can sing this last verse of Mary's song. For God reaches out to all people, wherever they may be. 
You see, this is the Magnificat, and it's filled with praises to God who works miracles. And the only people whose souls can truly magnify the Lord are people who acknowledge their lowly estate and are overwhelmed by the mercy and grace of a magnificent God. Do you know Mary's God? This is the God that Mary knew. Faithful Christians throughout the millennia sing Mary's song as their own by their own words and by their lives. And so during Christmas, people often ask the question, what do you give the person who has everything? Well, I'd like to ask, what do you give to the God who owns everything? You give him your praise. You magnify him in your life. You give him your life. Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, be it done to me according to your will. That's what God wants. So may this year's Christmas carols for you include another Christmas carol, Mary's song. From your heart, may each of us sing the Magnificat. To God be all the praise and glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing Mary's song into her heart, for choosing her and choosing us and all people whom you will and whom you love to be your children. May we receive you and believe your promises like a child, like Mary did, and that we should say in our heart of hearts, be it done to me according to your will. O oh Lord, thank you for the first Christmas carol that was sung by this young maiden of Israel. May it become our song as well. In Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen.